see fit. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Jeanette Jackson, CEO of Foresight. I'm very delighted about the conversation uh, we're going to have today with some esteemed guests. This is our 10th webinar in our COVID-19 series. Uh, and of course, I think like most of us, we're now trying to grasp, okay, as COVID-19 starts to become less of a priority, how do we navigate our way back to regular business? So um, that's definitely what this conversation is intended to kick off today. Uh, in terms of our agenda, a few quick welcome notes. We are recording the session. Uh, if you have questions, please enter them in the chat. And of course, we'll be opening it up for Q&A uh, towards the end of the session. I'm just going to announce one new COVID-19 support program for clean tech companies, and then we'll dive right into the panel. Um, so let's do that. Um, program announcements. We're very uh, delighted to be launching a new cl um, clean tech SME COVID-19 support program actually today. So you can now go on the website and sign up. We will be able to support over 40 clean tech SMEs across Canada as you navigate the new norms. And this will include things like grant writing, fundraising, you know, business development. And we're going to be doing this in a variety of ways. It'll be some cohort based work, online sessions. And of course, as you can imagine, everything will be virtual. And I just want to shout out and thank National Re uh, Research Council for supporting uh, this initiative. And then if you are a water tech company and have not already applied, we also have the water tech program, uh, Pan Canada on the Foresight website as well. And there's very specific water tech uh, activities that we'll be supporting with that. Um, now moving on, we're going to dive right in. The conversation today is about our transition to a clean economy and how overcoming challenges and collaboration can be mechanisms and tools to get us there faster, better, smarter. And of course, it wouldn't uh, be a panel without some great guests. And really, I'm going to allow everyone to do their own introductions uh, because uh, it's, it's way easier for myself that way. But we have Bertrand Picard um, from Solar Impulse, who's going to start off with his story. We have Wal Van Lierup from Chrysalex, which is a, a local uh, venture capital firm in clean tech, but does lots of activity uh, worldwide. Uh, Mark Warren from Fortis BC. And uh, obviously, it's really important that we have the, the industry uh, perspective and then to close off with Steve Slater, and if you haven't been following along the great work that Tara Mara has been doing uh, to really help position BC as a leader in ag tech and, and innovation in general, um, then you've been missing out. So with that said, um, I am going to go ahead and pass it right over to Bertrand. Please, um, over to you, Bertrand. Love to, you know, you have five to ten minutes, so go, go at it. Yes. Thank you, Janet. Hello to, to everyone. Very nice to participate from Switzerland to your webinar. You know, when I initiated the Solar Impulse project to fly around the world in a solar powered airplane, the specialist answered immediately, it is impossible because you will not get enough energy from the sun to run the airplane day and night. And it's true that you cannot increase the power of the sun. But what you can do to make it possible is to decrease the consumption of the airplane. And this is exactly what we have to do to make the most energy efficient airplane that ever existed in order to cope with the amount of energy we could get from the sun. And because the airplane specialists did not think we could do it, we had a shipyard building the airplane. And I think it's really a story that illustrates that today, we always want to produce more in order to consume more. And this is the world that was before the COVID-19. It was a world of pollution, of inefficiency, a world that was unfair with a lot of inequalities, and a, lot, and a world also that was unstable and fragile. Uh, just with a virus like the coronavirus, you put everything down. So today in the crisis, when you hear people who say we want to go back to normal, the normal should not be the world we had before. And you know, when we face a crisis, the first reaction of people is to say, we want to recover what we had before. And all the energy is done to stop the evolution, to go back to the past, instead of turning the page and going forward. Going forward, by asking ourselves, 
how can we exit the crisis stronger and better than when we enter the crisis? So I think today we really have to imagine how we can make a world that is more efficient, that is more fair, and that is stronger. So when we speak of the economy, it's interesting to see that already last year, a lot of industries were very afraid of having a recession. Why that? Because all the people who can afford to buy something have already bought it. And the other people didn't have the financial means to buy it. So basically, there was a stagnation in consumption, and it was very close to a recession. When we hear that, don't we think that we should offer to the people something new, something better, something more efficient? So it is not to consume more. It is to consume something else. And what I have noticed through the Solar Imports project is that the clean technologies today, the renewable energies, have become much more profitable than the old traditional energies and technologies. And it pays by itself. When you install renewable energies, when you install energy efficiency, when you have a better insulated house, when you have a more modern infrastructure, it pays by itself. It means that you invest, and because you consume much less, because you're much more efficient, you can recover your investment much faster. So today, when we think of building a new world, we have to understand that the biggest market opportunity, the market opportunity that will create the highest number of new jobs, the highest rate of profit, is it is to replace what it is polluting by what is protecting the environment. And this is really important. This is qualitative growth. Qualitative growth is when you make money and create jobs by replacing what is polluting, outdated, inefficient, by what is efficient, modern, and clean. This is the market of the century. I could not have said this 10 years ago because all these technologies, all these clean energies were too expensive. They needed a sacrifice from the population. They needed subsidies from the government. So it didn't work. But today it is logical as much as ecological. It means that even for people who don't care about protecting the environment, even for climate change deniers, it makes sense to use these new technologies to modernize our infrastructures. And this is in the field of water. This is in the field of energy construction, mobility, agriculture, industry. In all these fields, there is so much to do because today we still use technologies or so-called technologies that were invented 100 years ago at the beginning of the oil era. So if we want to be modern, now we have to replace what is old by what is modern and efficient. So it's what uh, can relaunch, can boost the economic recovery much more than going back to the past. And in order to prove this, we have started with the Solar Impulse Foundation, with a partnership with ICN, International Clean Tech Network, uh, with the Climate Group in San Francisco, with uh, uh, Ecotech Quebec in, in Canada. We, we have started to select and label 1,000 technological solutions that are at the same time protecting the environment and bringing profit. Profit to the producer and profit to the user. So the goal is to have a thousand of them because when you have a thousand, it means you have plenty, you have enough. So we aim at a thousand. Today, we have already 520. But can you imagine 520 solutions that prove that protecting the environment is more profitable than destroying the environment. So we have startups, but also big companies who are uh, submitting the, the solutions and uh, everyone can, can, can do it as long as, the, as it protects the environment in a profitable way and that it's credible, not just an idea for the future, but something that exists today that can come on the market or already on the market today. So it's startups or big companies who are submitting the solutions and they are assessed by a group of 450 experts who work for free with us because we are fully non-for-profit. And when they get 
uh, the proof that they are profitable, protect the environment, and they are technically credible, they receive the solar impulse foundation label, efficient solution label. And with this, what do we want to do? Of course, we want to help the startups to be better known, to have better access to, um, to investors, but we also want to approach all the governments and show them that the tools already exist to have much more ambitious energy policies and environmental targets. Because today, let's be clear, when we are in a startup that is producing clean technologies, we have no chance on the market because it is still allowed to pollute. It is still allowed to throw as many waste as you want in the ocean, in the air, in the soil, junk, uh, toxicals in the food and, and everything. It is allowed to destroy the planet, to destroy humankind, to destroy health, to destroy the oceans. So a lot of people say, we have no reason to change because it's legal. What, what we do is legal. So imagine if we can bring all these technological solutions that create jobs and make profits to the governments. It can encourage them to modernize the regulation, to encourage the introduction of these technologies on the market to the user. And this is something that can change the world because technology alone will not change the world. But what we do with technology can change the world. All the regulation that can encourage new markets, new type of businesses. In the circular economy, you have a lot of new jobs that will be created in fields that don't yet exist today. Can you imagine that? We can create the future. We can create new dimensions for the industry, for the economy, for, for, for everyone. So today, we are not just at the stage where we have to tell the world is beautiful, nature is fragile, and life is a miracle on this planet. No, we have to say much more to the key decision makers, to the people in the industry and in the politics. We have to speak their language because they sometimes don't understand the language of protection of the environment. So if we speak their language and we say, look, here are solutions coming from technology that creates more jobs and make more profits than what we had before, I think it's really a good, uh, good argument to, to make them change. So you see, as an explorer, I would love to come back from my expeditions with Solar Impulse, with the Brightling Orbiter 3 balloon and say, we have to save the world because we have to protect the environment because it's the duty of humankind to do it. But it would be useless because amongst us, amongst the people who understand this language, it's clear but the others don't understand that language. So we really have to change our way of speaking in order to be understood by the people who have the power to change something in this world. So what I'm saying now is really a deep conviction. It's also a call to solution. All the companies who have a technological solution in the field of water, mobility, construction, energy, agriculture, and industry, can submit it and get the label and participate to this action where we prove that the protection of the environment is profitable. So it's a big adventure we can all do together. And I'm really happy to be able to, to explain this and later on after my other colleagues will present their topics to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bertrand. Um, yes, we've been delighted as Foresight to be a member of ICN and have been following along the great work that you've been doing with the Solar Impulse Foundation and, and happy to support uh, companies if they have questions. And we, maybe we can dive into some of the uh, uh, criteria a little bit later on. You made a couple of really interesting comments. One, I love the term qualitative growth. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of countries around the world take a step back and, and reflect on, on how they label growth um, in the future, and then logical and ecological. So I really, I really like that. Thank you for sharing. Next, I'm going to pass it over to Wal van Leerup from Chrysalix. Wal, why don't you chime in and share what's been happening at Chrysalix and some of your priorities and perspectives right now? Thank you, Jeanette, and thank you, Bertrand, for your very nice introduction. So here we are, almost at the bottom of a recession. And uh, very important is don't spoil this recession. The bad is never as bad as it thinks. The good will never be as good as it thinks. But let me tell you a story. 
So it's 1930s. At the bottom of the recession 100 years ago, and IBM was led by Mr. Watson. And Mr. Watson was trying to sell his first calculation machine to all kinds of banks. But of course, with the recession going on, there was no bank that wanted to, uh, to uh, buy. And Mr. Watson was totally depressed. He had the layoff people. He didn't know how to make, uh, make payroll. IBM was going to go bankrupt. And his wife said to him, come, I take you out. We go to a restaurant. And he's very depressed. And uh, his wife started to talk to the lady on the next table. She asked, why is your husband so depressed? And she explains. And she asks, gee, what does your machine do? And during dinner, they realized that uh, she needed a machine like that. She was the head of the New York Public Library. And she needed an inventory management system. And that's what saved IBM. And so we are now at a position where really we have to press our innovation. Because what is typically going to happen, people are looking where we need to go and, we, and they see three buckets. The one bucket is, how do we restart what we had? And the second bucket is, we were already working on these things, let's put them out as soon as possible. And part of our green deal thinking is in that bucket. But there is the third bucket, and that is the bucket of what are suddenly opportunities that did not exist there. And so when we go to green, we need to think about the four things that we do for green. One is decarbonization, this is very clear. Two is digitalization for green. And we have been working on that. And of course, now we see that with digitalization is exploding. Many digital things will just create totally new green opportunities. The third is decarbonization. And that is going on faster than ever. In my experience, it's not stopping. It has not stopped. The Microsoft of this world have, have uh, announced plans earlier this year for very significant decarb targets and they will continue. We are in serious discussions with them and nothing is stopping them. And then the fourth element is culture, behavior. Until, six weeks, uh, until three months ago, we thought that people would not change their behavior. Oops, that's out of the window. So we have to think what are totally new things we will see decentralization. We will see totally changes of supply chains in our systems. So as a whole, so I would, I mean, I can continue talking about this for a long time, but I would <laughs> urge everybody, like really press your thinking, <laughs> press your thinking. What are suddenly enormous opportunities that did not exist before? In, 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 uh, in, in clean, we will see that urban areas suddenly see totally different things happen. We will almost for sure not see at least 30% of the workforce coming back to urban areas. What does that mean? We see in a city like Vancouver where we really had a housing problem, suddenly that more than half of the Airbnb stock is dropped into the market and we don't have a housing problem any longer. So mm -hmm. we need to press our imagination. What can we do in the current, under the current circumstances? What are the extra green things and equality things? And now you alluded to that, that we really have to put in our narrative if we want to discuss what future we want to have by 2030, 2040. Let me stop here. Thank you so much, Wal. That's super interesting. And just to recap the four points, it's decentralization, decarbonization, digitalization, and cultural behavioral. Is that right? Yeah. Phew. 
Um, and I love the, the term um, sort of pressing innovation and pressing our imagination. And we're definitely at that point and, and we'll get into some of that um, in a little bit. Steve, why don't I pass it on to, to you and, and what you have been working on at Terramera and all the different experiences that you, you're going through now. Okay, uh, thank you. And I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to join this uh, great panel. Um, so I think actually what I'm gonna do is give a couple of very specific examples of, of, of what we're working on. Uh, one project that was started before the whole COVID thing, um, but we're taking advantage of the situation and another one that was brought on by it. So the first one is that we've been, we've been thinking for a long time as a company that's involved in, we sort of operate at the, at the junction of, 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 of agricultural, biological, chemical, and computational sciences. Um, and so one of the things that we're particularly interested in is, is atmospheric carbon um, and also soil carbon because it's a, it's a critical resource. And it turns out that, um, that having higher carbon, higher organic carbon, um, uh, by, by, by organic, I mean carbon incorporated into, into complex molecules that are quite stable, ha having higher um, carbon content in the soil is great for the soil. It uh, leads to better retention of water, re better retention of nutrients. You get overall better yields on crops if you've got higher carbon content. Uh, and the way carbon gets in there is through, through plants. We as a, as a population, as a civilization, over, uh, over the past several thousand years have released a lot of carbon that had been maintained in the soil simply by the act of plowing, where you turn the soil over that carbon becomes exposed to air, it gets degraded and released into the, into the atmosphere. And so we'd like to reverse that, that process and start capturing carbon. So if you think about what you can do, you can take about eight and a half tons of carbon per acre out by only adding 1% of, of, to the amount of carbon that's, that's in the soil. And we've seen plenty of examples where you can add five, eight, 10, even 12%. Um, so a 1% lift is not a particularly high one. But the question is, how do we do that? How do we incent land managers, that includes farmers, um, to, to make sure that that, that that happens? So there's currently a lot of discussion about carbon markets and carbon credits and, and, and growers have, have sold carbon credits, but there's really no good way to validate, number one, that they actually, the grower who sold those credits is actually doing what they said they were gonna do and, uh, and also that they don't backslide in a couple of years and that carbon in the soil goes back down and then they turn around and resell those carbon credits again. So, so what we've been focused on is building a business that can, that can use remote sensing to, uh, to validate both agricultural practices and uh, eventually we, we hope and we believe um, carbon content, at least in, in a directional way, is it going up or down? Um, and, by doing it in a, in a, using remote sensing, we'll be in a position to, um, to, to demonstrate change in a way that would have backing of markets, governments, NGOs, groups who are interested in these sorts of things. Um, and, and we've taken advantage of the current um, COVID situation by uh, taking some of the resources that uh, within our company that we're working on other projects that we haven't been able to do um, nearly as intensively a lot of the laboratory work, for example, because we have to uh, have fewer people in the lab at any one time. Uh, and we've, we've diverted some of those people onto helping us develop how that remote sensing is gonna work, develop the business plans, et cetera. Uh, and so we're building that up and, uh, and are quite excited about uh, the opportunities to do that. And since we've uh, been talking about this and actually put some stuff on our website, and we've had a number of people come to us with solutions that some of which are really intriguing um, and may be taking us in completely different directions. So, so that's really exciting. Uh, and, and it's a case where we know there's a benefit, there's an environmental benefit versus, versus, well, excuse me, both in terms of reduced atmospheric carbon and higher productivity on soils. Um, but the question is, how do, you, how do you create an economic incentive to, to, to drive that? And we're, we're gonna try to provide the underpinning for that. So that's one thing that we've been doing. And the second example is actually very COVID specific. So my background is I'm a geneticist and biochemist. Um, and when the, the COVID situation hit, 
a, a few of us inside the company sat down and said, what can we do? What can we do about this situation? We've got a lot of talent. Um, we understand biology and chemistry. We understand things like uh, machine learning. Is there something we can do? And we thought hard about what could be done to, to solve or to help solve the current situation. And what it very click, quickly led us to is there's lots of people trying to solve the current situation. What, who's working on the next situation? Who's working on the next waves of the, of the virus that are gonna come? And what are those gonna look like? So a bit more thinking, and it was pretty clear that the, the virus is, is quite likely to be mutating in ways that will eventually escape herd immunity. So you're gonna see this in particular in some of the, the poorest, most crowded areas of the world where they don't have the resources, even if a vaccine existed, to get everybody vaccinated. That's where the, the current virus is gonna cause the most devastation. Um, but it also becomes the selective, it creates the selective pressure for the next mutant of that virus uh, to escape the herd immunity that's developing in, for example, the, the you know, the, the favelas of, of Rio or whatever. So, so we decided, okay, we're not gonna work on COVID. We're gonna work on what comes next. What is the next evolutionary path for it? And we put together a team that consists of a structural biology lab at the University of British Columbia, uh, a group that works on protein folding um, called Menton AI, a, a couple of companies that uh, design vaccines and uh, therapeutic antibodies and tests. And we have created a, a new project that was just funded by the Digital Supercluster. Uh, so this is our second grant from them actually, um, to, to predict the evolutionary path of the, of the virus by looking at what are the statistically the most likely uh, mutations to occur, using computational models to, to predict whether or not that will still have, uh, be able to bind to the receptor, and then asking, are the epitopes on the outside of the virus likely to change in a way that would escape herd immunity? And then we are, on the structural biology side, taking those predictions of those particular structures, and we are expressing and purifying hundreds and hundreds of different versions of those mutants of that, of that particular part of the, of the virus, that particular protein. And we're comparing our predictions to the reality, and we are using machine learning to drive a model that will highly accurately predict the structure of that, of that protein so that we can say, okay, this is likely to be something that will, will evolve. And then once we've done that, we have a compendium of possible mutations ranked in terms of likelihood. Uh, and we can pre-design vaccines, we can pre-design therapeutics, we can pre-design testing. So all of that design work is on the shelf. And when the next one emerges, we can pull that off the shelf and go right into manufacturing. So here's an example of where we've taken a crisis in two examples and turned it into a new a new area, uh, a new type of business, an area that we would have not in the past got into, but that's going to open up all kinds of opportunities for our machine learning team. That's great. Oh, that's really cool, Steve. I think there's some really interesting notes there. I mean, on the first example, it's not really a pivot. It's an opportunity to look at your product and technology roadmap and think of how you can leapfrog ahead of some of your previous kind of preconceived notions on what that was going to look like. And um, you know, as you know, Foresight supports hundreds of, of clean tech SMEs that are a little bit earlier stage than you. And, you know, I think we've seen a lot of them have the opportunity to do that. Um, some have pivoted, um, but others uh, have, have been able to think about that leapfrog, whether it's supply chain and all this stuff. So it's been great. Uh, Mark, love to hear from, uh, from, for, from yourself and, and what's happening at Fortis, you know, given all these sort of dynamic changes and opportunities. Good afternoon, everybody, and greetings from Kelowna. Yeah, my name is uh, Mark Warren, and I'm working, I'm sure, for the, what superficially, at least, the most boring organization of everybody, a gas and electric utility. And um, Fortis BC uh, operates in British Columbia, but Fortis Inc., our parent company, is uh, operates across North America and the Caribbean. And um, uh, as such, because we're an essential service, we have been, unlike our customers, relatively unimpacted. Uh, by COVID-19 so far. However, some at, at least two of the things that have been mentioned are going to continue to impact us considerably over the next decades. And that is, you know, digitalization and decarbonization are certainly two of them. 
And so if we want to remain uh, an essential service over the years to come, uh, the utility industry, as, as we all know, is going to have to transform itself. Uh, at, at Fortis BC, we're primarily a natural gas distribution company, although we have an electric operation as well. So we see, uh, you know, we see both of the, of the opportunities in both of those sectors. We have an objective uh, to reduce our uh, customers' emissions 30% by 2030. And we have, uh, and we want to be carbon neutral at Fortis BC um, by 2050. And we have a very, uh, what we think is a very practical plan to get there. It begins with energy efficiency. That is something that we have been involved with for uh, decades now at, uh, at this point. But we have been steadily ramping up our efforts there, mostly in terms of the, of the investments we're going to make in energy efficiency um, uh, uh, products and services for our customers. So over $100 million in investments there over the next few years. But we are beginning to move more and more into trying to advance uh, the research and development in this area as well and funding um, startup companies and academic institutions that are uh, advancing um, the state of the art in, in energy use. Perhaps not made as much as Bertrand's uh, solar airplane, but that's where we're we're trying to go. So that's, that's one key pillar. Another one is changing the fuel source where, uh, where we have a higher carbon fuel source. We're, we're lucky in that our electricity in this province is, is, is mostly hydroelectric. Um, so uh, we're, we're good there at the moment. Our natural gas system, however, is something we're really trying to decarbonize. And one of the ways is drop in fuel replacements such as uh, renewable gases. In this province, woody bio, uh, converting woody biomass into methane is, is one key area for that. But we're also looking at um, uh, substituting at least portions of the, uh, of the gas delivery system with uh, renewable hydrogen as well. Um, and uh, as well uh, in the end use categories, we're trying to de decarbonize certain end uses. In this province, we are supplying, we're displacing diesel in natural, uh, in trucking and marine, like the ferry applications. We are uh, involved in electric vehicle recharging. And so we are also trying to decarbonize end uses. And, and finally, we are also working on uh, microcarbon capture technologies. That is probably the area that uh, requires the most development at this point. And to, to achieve all of these things, uh, it's, it's requiring a very broad amount of collaboration. I spend a lot of my time talking to wonderful institutions like Foresight who are helping us out with, uh, uh, with some, cha uh, some technical challenges. We talk a lot to government, academia, industry. Reg uh, we are regulated, of course, and so, um, the amount of collaboration that it's going to take to get us where we need to go is is considerable and i'll leave it there no that's great that's great thank you um it's i feel like fortis has really um at least for me i you know i joined uh, as ceo of foresight in in 2018 and every couple of months there's some new progressive initiatives on how you're thinking about how an organization like fortis has to evolve um, not only from a, a green economy, green operations perspective, but to be competitive as new things and dynamics change. And hydrogen, I think, is a huge opportunity. We see not only here in BC, um, but um, in Western Canada and other countries around the world, it's come up on several international calls over the last uh, several months. So hydrogen is definitely a really interesting, interesting area of focus. So maybe I can just open it up with all uh, three of you, uh, sorry, four of you, in terms of um, the first question I kind of want to talk about is like, what are some of the real biggest challenges that we're facing? And I know while you touched on sort of decarbonization, digitalization, de um, decentralization, um, and I know Bertrand, you have quite a, a, a few insights as well, but if you were to each recommend sort of one big challenge that we needed to come together to overcome, you know, what would that be from your perspective? Uh, Bertrand, perhaps I'll put you on the spot. Yes, for me, the biggest challenge is to overcome the inertia and the laziness of the people who have to take the decisions. Because it's always more easy 
to keep on doing the same than in the past than to change. So we really have to give the taste of changing to encourage people and show them how much better they will be, how much richer they will be, how much whatever they will be if they accept to change. And if they break this inertia that always keeps the past in the present instead of putting the future in the present already now. You're on mute. Thank you. Uh, Walt? Yeah, I mean, along similar lines, I mean, many people who are currently in the lead, in power, see the future through the lens of their past experiences. Uh, and that may not be where you get the winning formula. So, I mean, maybe this is the moment that young people can really break through. Maybe this is the moment that old people have to say, gee, why don't you young people press <laughs> your imagination? Because things will be possible that we, we're probably too comfortable. We rely too much on experiences from the past. And many people, uh, I mean, both on the left and the right, uh, are hanging on to what they have. But young people now have an opportunity. And like I said, there will be amazing new things that, uh, that this crisis is forcing us to go to. And it goes way beyond uh, uh, putting in place the plans that we thought we should have been put in place. While, uh, for instance, Petra and I were discussing about the Green New Deal, even in January at the Clean Tech Conference in San Francisco. The, the playing field is totally changing. And it is, it is the time for young people to come to the forefront and, and grab some range. Well, thank you all. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm much older than, than one might think. Um, Steve, I know you and I have talked a lot about even how um, and I don't want to sort of lead you in a direction, but we've, we've talked a little bit about how, how people live and work and play now is completely disrupted. Is that a direction you would say um, some of our challenges now have been overcome or would you have some other thoughts? Um, well, I'm not sure about overcome. I mean, I think, I think we're dealing with very different challenges right now in terms of our ability to get out and, 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 and spend time together. Right. And so, um, so that's, uh, that's created new, new issues, but it's also going to create new, uh, um, it's going to create new in industries and I think it's going to kill some other ones. Mm -hmm. I would not want to be the president of a cruise line right now, for example. I also wouldn't want to be uh, highly invested in Manhattan real estate right now because I think the way that we work is going to change quite a bit and we're going to spend less time in the office uh, and more time working like this. Um, uh, it, but but given given that reality, if there is no substitute for being in the same room with with your colleagues and, and collaborators, and so you know exactly how that all is going to work, um, it, it's a big question. Um, and then I'll 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 I'll, I'll tack on to this. Um, don't want to go too political, but look at what's going on right now. It's the, there's there's a real lack of leadership. I mean, I'm an American. I'm just appalled by the display that I saw yesterday and ongoing from uh, the, the president. And so we have to fix our politics too. We have to get back to a point where as a community, we recognize that there is strength, resilience, um, and, and the ability to move forward together, not because, you know, what's in it for me. So, so that's a difficult one. Uh, on top of everything else, but we've got to find a way to get there because the path we're headed down right now is not a good one. Yeah. No, definitely noting the sentiment there. Um, Mark? Well, I think we're doing uh, fairly well on this panel for a bunch of old white guys so far, but um, <laughs> the uh, 
I, I think it is very difficult to create a sense of urgency around, uh, at least for a, a lot of uh, a lot of older people, frankly, creating a sense of urgency around uh, what seems to be a very nebulous threat in the future. You know, the the, the threat of climate change. And so, you know, what we do at Fortis BC is, to, I mean, we take a very practical approach. We use the, you know, we use the advantages we have in terms of being a regulated utility, being relatively close to government to do things, you know, to, to create incentives like we did with our renewable natural gas program. We were one of the first companies in North America America to offer that. And we did that in partnership. And we did that by, you know, collaborating with government and the regulator to create a, an incentive of up to $30 a gigajoule to actually for us to purchase renewable natural gas and, and bring it onto our system. And then we work with a variety of organizations, as I mentioned, like Foresight and other companies around the province to actually provide that natural gas. And so I mean, there's the, you know, the, the, the almighty dollar is one of the ways that we can uh, create incentives for change. This is, a, I think, a great segue into, you know, the almighty dollar. We're going to see a lot of uh, restart and recovery initiatives uh, as a result of this health crisis. Um, maybe we'll go backwards this time. Um, Mark, if you know, when it comes to collaboration and challenges and funding, you know, and priorities, um, what would you hope to see, you know, in BC, Western Canada, Canada, um, as priorities for those for those initiatives? Well, I mean, I, th I think I've hit the I, I think I've hit the keys already. I think that we, in, in order to transition to a, a, a lower carbon economy in a way that isn't going to bankrupt us, we just you, you know we need to take very pragmatic approaches and find ways that make um, uh, te techno economic sense, I guess. And so we're continuing just to push a, 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 in a in a in as collaborative a manner as we can for changes that can, you know, that are go going to make a difference now, like our, like our renewable natural gas program, but keeping an eye on the future and making sure that we are advancing research as well. Uh, so it, it isn't just at the, it isn't just at the, at the shovel in the ground stage with, we also need to work on actually advancing research. And I don't think that's something that we do enough in this country. Uh, overall, um, but the government, is, I think, uh, the, both the federal and provincial governments have been moving more that way, and we're not seeing them pulling back post COVID nineteen, and maybe even increasing. So, very encouraging signs. Yeah, no, absolutely. We see. I mean, even from the startup perspective, you know, we see incremental technologies that are low hanging fruit, you know, quick wins, and then we have that really large, you know, disruptive mentality, whether it's general fusion or or carbon engineering and 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 folks and and, and whatnot. So, um, Steve, can I re rephrase the question? Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, just it just in when it comes to sort of as we restart the economy, you know, how do we set priorities uh, when we're transitioning to a, a clean economy? You know, given this opportunity that we have in front of us. So I'll, I'll echo a bit of what what Mark said. The, the, there's lots of good ideas and lots of things that will improve uh the environmental situation but they aren't all economical and it's off often the hardest part of implementing something is developing a business model that will actually work particularly one that doesn't rely on a particular set of government regulations because anytime you do that you're setting yourself up for eventual failure eventually the regulations change eventually the government changes so so finding ways to monetize, for example, what I was talking about with soil carbon, that is often the big question mark. And so there's a lot of room for innovation there. And that's where I'd love to, to see a lot more, a lot more focus. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. We're moving into sort of with Wall and Bertrand. And I know, you know, Bertrand, you're in, in Europe and we had uh, Jeremy Rifkin here um, on a discussion a couple of weeks ago um, and when it comes to collaboration and Green New Deal, that's really the whole essence of his philosophy. I don't know, um, Wall and Bertrand, do you want to chime in on your thoughts around how something like that could could set a tone or or bring more folks together? Yes, yes, oh. absolutely. You 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 know, 
what we have to see is that innovation usually is pushed by subsidies, grants, pitches, accelerators, helping the startups to, to grow a little bit. And then nothing happens very often because they have no access to the market. They have no access to the market because the regulation is still favorizing the old stuff. So we have to understand that the role of regulation is not just to put bans to prohibit things, it's also to, to allow things to happen. So if the regulation, by putting very high and ambitious targets for the environment, for the energy consumption, for the efficiency, for the use of waste and things like that, create a necessity that will pull the innovation to the market because there will be a need, then it's a fantastic help for the startups to grow. This is where the new jobs are going to be created. So the regulation, in my sense, has a huge impact, very positive impact, as long as you set the target. But of course, you don't explain how to do it. You should not say that all the cars has, have to be electric, because otherwise you will kill something else, a new innovation. But if you say that the maximum amount of particles or energy consumption is set very precisely, then all the technology will come to allow this target to be reached. Uh, otherwise, it will never happen. Otherwise, you, you will have innovation in universities, but then everything will stop because nobody will use it. Well, we come from an area, from an era of, of globalization. And uh, British Columbia is a very small entity. We thrive with a global open economy. So there is a threat here. There is the threat of protectionism, the threat of uh, Silicon Valley uh, having become in the past uh, uh, decade more of a research and development center. And scaling up of a lot of what we did in clean tech happened in China. How are geopolitical disturbances going to upset this? What is happening with the very large companies that are basically gobbling up small companies? So we need to have to find the right balance between what is more and more going to happen locally with what we need to do globally, because Switzerland, the Netherlands, uh, Canada, we're small economies and we benefit from working with each other. We benefit from relationship. So we really, as smaller companies, and, and I include Japan and even Korea in that, in that uh, uh, set of smaller companies, we need to, to close ties we need, uh, we need uh, discussions and collaborations to the extreme because the big players in the world are going for protectionism. And, and so we have to push our imagination, like how can we play in that area? Because we need an open economy. That is what the world, that's in the interest of the world. Yeah. Open economy and, and open innovation. We've got a couple of questions here. I'm going to start from the bottom up. There's always that one elephant in the room regarding uh, the bridge between oil and gas and, and renewal, renewables. Um, Bertrand, would you like to sort of give your perspective on, on that? Yes, we should not consider the oil and gas companies are as enemies and fight against them. I don't think it would be right. I think we have to make an alliance with them in order to find ways to diversify the sources of energy and go from oil and gas company to an energy company. And why that? Why is it so important? Because the investors now, pension funds, life insurance and so on, are understanding very well that oil and gas is a stranded asset. It's a stranded asset when you speak of investment because the value of the shares are based on the reserve of oil that they can exploit. And today we know very well that it will not be all exploited, all these reserves, which means that the share are overestimated. Maybe they are worth half of the value 
that you pay on the market today. And as soon as the investors understand that, they're going to sell all these shares. And it will make a financial crash. Financial crash. Because we will need oil. The oil companies will still be rich. There will still be oil. But everybody is going to sell their shares and make the market crash. So we have to help the companies producing oil and gas to survive with other businesses. Because if they fall, we fall. So we are really linked together. We, we are in the same boat. And the boat should not sink. So diversification uh, is started already by a couple of companies. I give you the example of Schlumberger. Schlumberger is an oil exploitation company. Exploration. They, they drill for oil. And what do they start to do now? They start to drill for geothermia in the cities. They drill the wells to have heat pumps in all the, the tall buildings of, uh, of the cities. This is a fantastic new market. And it's done by an oil exploitation company. So we see that there is not bad and good. We have the task to negotiate with them, to motivate them, to take the best out of them, to change course and go into all these new technologies because they have the money, they have the technology, they have the power, and they also can do good. Does anyone else want to comment before we close up today? Yeah, I have, I have uh, written extensively uh, in the past months uh, in, for example, uh, Forbes on this topic. And, and Bertrand, you're so right. Uh, we should not say, gee, they are the enemy. It's not black and white. We, we cannot, but also at the same time, people should realize that not oil, all oil is the same. Uh, unfortunately, our Canadian oil is sitting very high on the cost curve. So the market will push that away soonest. Uh, on the other hand, we may still have an opportunity with natural gas. Uh, maybe that needs to still become a transition fuel between now and 2030, 2035, because uh, there is not enough clean tech at scale available today to replace coal in, in China. Uh, so, but we need to ensure that we bring the oil companies and particularly the workers in the oil industry in Alberta along in our energy transition. That's very important. Steve or Mark, do you have any? Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I very much agree with Bertrand uh, and Wall on this. It's, um, I, th you know, I think any oil and gas company that isn't aggressively looking to diversify is not going to be around for very long. I think that the hard part is, f is for government especially is to find the right balance of, of uh, incentives and disincentives that we can maintain a, a viable energy industry in the short term while allowing those that are innovative to, um, uh, to morph themselves into a, a different looking energy company 20 years down the road. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balancing act over the next couple decades for sure, very tricky. But, but yet, yet you want those companies to feel enough pain to know that they have to transition, right? Yeah. So and yeah, that's really very much the balancing act. In there's fact, not much problem with pain these days, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> we hang more up care. In, in two minutes, I'm going to be on a call with a major energy company. So yeah. they are thinking about it. They're thinking about it. Um, the question is how to do it um, and, and how to do it in a way that's, that's sustainable and doesn't create more pain. I mean, this, we saw the pain in uh, Alberta, for example, last election. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the, the outcome of that, of the, the elections in Alberta had to do with exactly that issue. Yeah. Well, this has been amazing. I really appreciate everyone's time today. Um, there's so many kind of summary notes that I want to kind of put in everyone's head. But in terms of collaboration and coming together to solve problems, I think what we're seeing here is whether you're an investor, whether you're from Switzerland, whether you're uh, scaling up SME or you know an organization like Fortis, we're all committed to solving these problems together. And there's an appetite to work together to figure out what those best paths forward are. Um, I also love a few notes in terms of really starting to think outside of the box and push our imaginations as we work to solve these problems. Um, there's lots of different communications and engagements going on with all levels of government 
to try to make sure that um, that they navigate this from a policy perspective with an understanding of what is possible because sometimes there's there's a gap there and so we're definitely bullish on on those communications um, and you know thank you all gentlemen for your time it's one o'clock thank you to all the attendees there's been some other sort of questions but we'll have to leave it for today and i wish everyone a really great week and we'll talk to you all soon thank you so much thank, thank you, you. Bye bye, bye. bye. bye.